So good uh, morning to those of you in the West, good evening to those of you in the East, and good afternoon to everybody in the uh, UK and European time zones. Um, thank you for joining us today to uh, look at and discuss airborne and structure borne ultrasound as part of our maintenance programs. Um, a few housekeeping rules um, for now. Um, we have a chat uh, window open for you to ask any questions to me um, during the presentation. Um, I will do my best to answer the um, questions and if um, we can, because we have a lot of people signing in. Um, if I cannot answer your questions um, at the end of this webinar, I will get back to you with answers to your questions um, after this uh, webinar is finished via email. We will also send out a survey uh, at the end of this um, webinar for any feedback. It's always greatly welcome to make sure that we are giving you the best information that you are after. So, a little bit about myself. My name is Christopher Hallam. Uh, I am the UK and Ireland manager for UE Systems. My contact details are on the screen as you see. Um, so you're always welcome to contact me with any questions and inquiries at any time as well. My background about myself, uh, I'm an electrical engineer by trade, um, serving many years um, in the Royal Air Force. And uh, I'm also a qualified trainer uh, working after the military on the rail sector and also gaining uh, certified maintenance and reliability professional status. And I've been with UE Systems uh, just over four years. So a little bit about UE Systems. Uh, UE Systems Inc. Uh, was founded back in the early 70s. Um, we're a company that's focused on research and development of ultrasonic equipment, um, providing um, ongoing support in our national and international offices. Uh, we do not provide um, services, but we provide the technology, the software and the support along with training to help people be self-sufficient to improve their own maintenance practices. We have uh, regional offices in North America, in Asia, in Europe and India in the Middle East. Of course, ourselves, myself, we come under the European um, division and within the European division, we also have um, direct um, members of our staff in the Netherlands, Germany, France, Poland, Italy, Spain, and of course the UK. Um, our main headquarters for Europe is in the Netherlands. Um, that's where any work that's carried out on equipment and calibrations is done as well. So, moving on to actually the subject that we're talking about today. The first thing that I always like to talk about is actually, do we actually have a plan on site? Do we know what we want to do with regards to improving our maintenance practices? First thing we need to think about actually is our assets um, on our site. And where do they lie in uh, regards to criticality? How critical are they to the processes that we are doing on site? So first things first would be maybe to look at a failure mode effect criticality analysis study to actually categorize what assets are important to us in what priority. We need to highlight what are our bad actors, where are our pinch points, that if we have a failure or a problem occurs, what effect is it going to have on the output of the production, for example. We also need to look at how much of our time we're going to spend on predictive maintenance and how much of our time we're going to spend on preventative maintenance practices, time-based maintenance practices, you could say. We could also look at certain assets, depending on their criticality, at a run to failure approach, because if we have redundancy in place or by them failing, we have a very limited impact on production, maybe we would not maybe do as much maintenance on those and relatively cheap and easy to repair on them. So run to failure is not a problem to be using on site. We also need to think about our people on site. And normally the hardest thing to change at the start of any implementation of a program is culture. A lot of people are used to doing things the way that they've always done them. Um, so culture is always a difficult thing to look at. We also need to think about training and developing our, our engineers on the site to help improve the way they do things. Because by giving training and development, people develop further and they then become more accountable and they want to do better. 
once we've looked at all of those sort of areas, we also need to think about the sort of technologies we're going to implement as part of a predictive maintenance program. And there are many, many technologies out there that all have their pros and cons and ways of finding certain failure modes. And used in combination can provide a great strategy towards gaining great reliability on site. Be that ultrasound, vibration, thermal imaging, oil analysis, motion amplification, or even utilizing online systems. So let's go into the basics of ultrasound. That's what we're here for today, just to understand how ultrasound actually works and then where we put it into our practice. So as humans, we can hear in the frequency range of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz from the age of about eight. From the age of eight, we start to lose our hearing um, where we start losing the higher frequencies. So most people of, grown, of adult age with relatively good hearing will hear between the region of 20 hertz and 16 and a half kilohertz, for example. Um, there are other ranges of sound in the infrasonic range where we have lower than 20 hertz that we cannot hear. We have the sonic range, which I just discussed. And also the ultrasonic range where, we're, where sounds are produced from 20 kilohertz and above outside of our human hearing range that we cannot hear unless we're using an ultrasound device. Now, the characteristics between high frequency ultrasound and low frequency audible sound are quite different. So low frequency sound waves, the sounds that we can hear, are strong and powerful in their source and nature. They penetrate solid objects. Um, from their source, they travel in all directions. So they're omnidirectional. And the multiple mode conversions talks about how it travels through solid objects. So locating the source of sound can be difficult. We can get an idea of its direction, but not so easily because of the mode conversions. When we get into high frequency sounds, the ultrasonic spectrum, the sound waves are shorter and they are weaker. They cannot penetrate solid objects, so it will come into contact with a solid object and most of the energy will be reflected. Some of it will be trapped within the structure, but it will not penetrate through the structure. And ultrasound at its source is more directional. So if we have an ultrasonic device in our hands with a set of headphones on, as we point towards the source of the sound, we will hear it. And as we move away from the source of the sound, we will lose it again. So it helps us with locating the source of that sound. Ultrasound is generated in two ways. The first being turbulent flow. So think of a pressurized system. If it has a leak, it will generate turbulence. In turn, that will generate ultrasound. And the second way ultrasound is generated is through friction. So anything that's rotating, anything that's moving together is generating friction. And that in turn also generates ultrasound. We can use ultrasound for in the airborne environment when we think about turbulence. And we can use it also in the structure borne area when it comes to things like friction. So covering the applications now, we're gonna just do an overview of the applications and then I'll go into those in more detail as we go along. So we can use ultrasound to help us with electrical inspection, inspection of valves for leakage, bearing and lubrication inspections, steam trap inspections, and leak detection. So as we can see, it's quite a versatile technology that has many, many applications. So all of these applications that we can use ultrasound for can be really categorized into two areas. The first being energy savings, and the second area being condition monitoring and predictive maintenance. And again, we will cover how that comes into place further through this presentation. So the first application is leak detection, probably one of the most widely used applications for ultrasound. And we need to look at why we would use leak detection for using ultrasound with. The first thing being safety. We have pressurized systems out there that are all they want to do is normalize their pressure with the environment. And of course, if we think about noxious gases, hazardous gases, we don't want to have leaks present in them. We also need to think about the economic side of it. 
compressed air systems and gases are expensive. And the more leaks we have, the more energy they are wasting and the more it is costing your company. We also need to think about the environmental impact because the more energy we're using by having all of these leaks, the more energy we're wasting and putting that into the environment. We also need to think about quality assurance as well, because some of these pressurized systems might have an effect on the outcome of our production, for example, or we might have vessels or vehicles that have a quality assurance side to it as well and have to have good seals. We can listen for leaks on vessels, on motor vehicles, on hatches, and all sorts of other things for a quality assurance approach too. So, as I was saying, a large percentage of energy wastes can be through compressed air systems. And a lot of people don't appreciate the actual cost behind a compressed air leak. And then if we have compressed gases, they are even at a higher cost as get again. Preparing our leaks can help reduce our compressor running hours. Because again, to keep the line pressure up, our compressors need to work hard if we have leaks. If we have less leaks, our compressors won't necessarily need to run as often. If we have less leaks and we can keep our line pressure up at a regular case, then we may have the potential to reduce our line pressure, again adding another energy saving perspective. We can use ultrasound for performing leak inspections in noisy environments because when we're listening in noisy environments, we're listening to the audible sound. And because ultrasound is directional, and again, through the use of ultrasound, an air leak or a compressed gas leak will sound like a leak you would expect to hear audibly. So we can pinpoint it directionally. And then once we've uh, pinpointed our uh, leaks, we can then quantify them using simple apps or using the software that's included with the kit. So I just want to give a little example of a leak report that um, was produced on a demonstration on a site. Uh, this demonstration took maybe half an hour in, in a um, room, in a plant, and in that half an hour, we found 10 leaks. And as we can see from this uh, report, we actually identified just over 5,000 euros per year of savings in just one room. Again, a very quick way of if we can identify these leaks and repair them, we can save money on these sites. And then along with these sort of leak reports that are produced from leak apps that we have and things like that, you can have picture reports alongside that. So then you can do your inspections, complete the report, and then hand it to somebody within the maintenance team to go ahead and repair these leaks. And as you repair them, you can then document your findings and document your savings. So another energy savings concept and application using ultrasound is steam trap inspection. Steam trap inspections are, well, steam systems themselves are um, highly expensive systems to run. And if they're not running to their best efficiency, we are wasting money. And of course, we, in our system, we have our steam traps that help us remove the condensate that helps improve, it helps cause the reduction in temperature, but hold back the steam. And if we've got faulty steam traps within our system, then we're wasting steam, we're wasting energy, we're losing money without realizing it. So again, we can actually listen to the types of traps to actually see what's going on. So using ultrasound for steam trap inspections can help us um, allow ourselves to have an immediate assessment on the condition of our traps by listening to the turbulent flow within the pipework. So the turbulent flow is in the pipework, generating the ultrasound, but it's not escaping the pipework itself. So this is where we would use the contact approach and listen on the outlet of the trap to the turbulent flow inside. Now, as long as the inspector understands the different types of traps that are out there and installed in our systems and how they work, we can get a good understanding of how we expect them to sound. And so we can make a fair judgment on the diagnosis. There are two main types of operations with our steam traps on our sites, and they consist of the on-off design traps, opening and closing. And then we have the continuous flow traps where we have a higher level of condensate that we need to uh, remove continuously. 
So understanding the different types of traps and how they operate is very important. So I just want to play some examples now of when they're good and when they're not so good. So for example, we have an on-off trap here, a thermodynamic dish trap. And using an ultrasound device, we would place our contact module on the outlet of the trap and we would then listen and do a sound recording. And this is what a thermodynamic dish trap may sound like in a good state. So as we can hear from that sound file there, we can hear the increase of turbulence as the trap opens and then the, the vast quick reduction in, in sound from turbulence as the trap closes again. That tells us that this is a good steam trap. The next one is of a continuous um, flow trap, in this case a float and thermostatic trap, where we will have a higher level of condensate within the trap. Um, so what we would expect to hear from this trap is a continuous steady level of turbulence, a level of sound. Also, depending on the type of float trap, will depend on other sounds we may hear as well. So in this case, it is a free floating um, thermostatic trap where we may hear the sound of a floating ball knocking against the side. And this is what we would hear in that respect. So we can hear the free float knocking around inside the chamber because it's floating on the condensate but behind that we can hear that steady flow of turbulence. So when a steam trap fails predominantly they fail in the open position so they're blowing through so when we were to then listen to the outlet of a trap that is failed we would probably expect to hear a high level of turbulence with no change in the sound. This is the sort of sound we would pick up in that case. So again, no change in the sound and we can see clearly a continuous flow of sound. That tells us that the trap is blowing through and is unserviceable. We could also use another technology to help us with this and that's where thermal imaging come in and, I, and with this we like to say that having two technology approaches can also help us with actually giving our evidence to as to our conclusions of our diagnostics so one technology will hear the problem another technology will see the problem because on the outlet of a steam trap it should be cooler than the inlet if we have condensate on one side which is cooler than steam and then on the out inlet we have the high temperature it tells us one part of the story. It tells us that the trap isn't blowing through, but is it telling us that the trap is actually working correctly? Or is it telling us that the trap is blocked? That's where ultrasound would then come in and provide that information. So I just wanna show um, a quick case study here. This was performed um, on a site as part of a training, going along collecting some information on some steam traps. So came across um, a bunch of thermodynamic dish traps. You've already heard how they should sound. So we started taking some recordings and doing some comparisons. Because again, as a trap starts to um, fail or start to lose its efficiency, it may operate slightly differently. A thermodynamic dish trap should cycle two to 10 times per minute. So this is what one of the steam traps sounded like. So from this sound recording and the image that we have on the display there, we can see that there's two bursts of turbulence showing us the trap opening twice in a, in a time of 16 seconds. So if we put that out to one minute, we can see that it quite clearly operates within its functional needs. 
we came across another trap and took another sound recording and heard slight, something slightly different. So we can see from this sound recording now that we have eight bursts of turbulence. All of them are a lot shorter in duration. So we can see that now this, this trap is not cycling to the um, OEM guidelines. This trap is now losing its efficiency. It is working to an extent, but it's already now showing us signs that this trap is on its way out to failure. This will start to occur more frequently over time until we get to a point where the trap will start to chatter as the disc itself on top is unable to close properly. So again, we can see now from the two comparisons of a good trap compared to one that's not efficient, we know where the work needs to be done. So moving on to the mechanical inspection, Another area that is widely used with ultrasound uh, is looking at our bearings, be it high speed, slow speed, and also for lubrication. One thing that uh, we want to talk about as well is this talk about reliability and availability and wanting to improve reliability using predictive technologies. Now, there's many discussions on this, and in my personal opinion, Reliability is built into the asset from the design stage. With predictive technologies, we are helping to highlight any problems so we can improve the availability of our assets. By using predictive technologies to highlight failures and using root cause analysis to feed that back to the designers, the designer may be able to change the design of the asset to help improve the overall reliability of the, of the asset itself. We also need to think about what failure modes we're looking for and also to understand that not, not one predictive technology will identify all possible failure modes. A two technology approach is ideal and talking about the, the DIP to F curve, ultrasound is one of the early detectors of a potential problem, like a stage one failure you could say, because the ultrasonic emission is the first characteristical change in an asset as we go along. We can also use it as a proactive tool to help us with our lubrication levels before there is a problem, listening to that friction level because lubrication is all about improving the friction and optimizing that friction within the bearing. So we can use it at an early stage to be proactive with our approach to our maintenance practices. So when it comes to mechanical testing and mechanical inspections, we again using the structure borne approach because the friction is generated by the bearing, the old sound is generated from there, it's trapped within the structure, so we're listening to what's going on inside, like, like a doctor would listen to your chest. A good bearing that's adequately lubricated will have relatively lower levels of friction and it should be smooth and uniform in nature. As we get a problem with a bearing, we will start to see increases in the ultrasound level, the decibels that are being produced, and we may hear a change in the tonal quality. The audible quality is also very important when listening to bearings and doing inspections, as well as the decibel value that's being produced by the bearing. The bearing will have a signature, it will have a sound, smooth and uniform in nature in an ideal environment. An increase in amplitude, so an increase in the decibel value that we're picking up, as well as a change in the audible quality, can indicate to us a bearing in an early stage of failure. So if we can picture in our minds a bearing rotating in an asset, a perfectly good one, we would expect to understand what sort of sounds are here already. Again, it's using our senses, it's heightening our senses to listen to what's going on inside at an early stage. because when we get to a point of walking through a plant and audibly hearing a problem, there already is a large problem at hand there already. We want to pick that up nice and early. So a good bearing would sound something like this. Smooth 
and uniform in nature and no fluctuation in the amplitude. When we get early stages of potential failure, we may start to hear crackling and popping that are non-uniform in nature because of the damage being so small. And this is what that would sound like. So as we can hear from this bearing, there is a crackling noise, it's non-repetitive, it's sporadic, because it's an early stage of a failure or early stage of a problem, you could say. Once we get to extreme damage, it becomes very apparent and very clear, especially in the audible, uh, the audio quality of the sound. The decibel level would have risen quite dramatically and the tonal quality would have changed. And this is what that would sound like. As you can hear from that squeaking sound there, it's also apparent that there is clear metal on metal rubbing causing that sort of sound. So there is a severe lack of lubrication within that bearing too. So I just want to go over a, a few case studies um, on bearing inspections. And these were done um, as part of a demonstration on site. This was just walking around a plant, looking at different types of assets and taking some readings. We came across uh, a couple of motors that were driving some pumps, the same design, same speed and load. So we thought we would do a comparison of the two. We took readings on the drive end of the motor at the same point on each motor and then took sound recordings for a comparison to understand the condition. We had no record of the lubrication last lubrication on this asset um, so again we had to go about this with an approach of let's compare it let's listen for the audible sound let's listen for the quality and then take a judgment from there so the first bearing on the drive end of this motor was at 29 decibels and this is what it sounded like So pretty smooth and uniform in nature. I believe that if we had the opportunity to apply some grease to this, the sound of this would actually reduce a little bit more because we would improve the friction levels. But it's a good place to start because it's smooth and uniform. So we moved on to the next motor and we took a measurement on the same point. And as you can see from this image, the decibel level had raised 61 decibels, quite a dramatic increase in level of sound. Also through the headset, we could hear a change in the tonal quality of the bearing. And it sounded something like this. From this sound recording, we can hear quite clearly a change in tonal quality and the rise in decibel value. So two like-for-like -like motors measured on the same point, we can now compare the two together. So as we have taken sound recordings, we can use our FFT to do a comparison. And as we can see from the white trace to the green trace, a marked difference in the decibel value and telling us that there is something wrong with the second reading. A couple of weeks later, they took the motor out of service and they found that the bearing inside itself had totally corroded away. There was a failure on that um, asset. So again, a good find. Another example of using ultrasound for mechanical inspection is on gearboxes. We have many rotating parts within the gearbox and in a good gearbox, it should be smooth and uniform in nature again. So we had a reading here where we could check the input shaft, output shaft, and the body of the gearbox because ultrasound is directional. So the sound, if we hear something abnormal, 
we can move the sensor around to the point where it is highest decibel that tells us that is the source. In this case, we took a reading on the body to listen inside the actual body of the gearbox. It should be smooth and uniform in nature. So we took a sound recording and this is what we heard. smooth and uniform, just the sort of sound we want to hear. So we can see the sound recording there that highlights to us that we have a gearbox that is in good working order. Another example of a reduction gearbox, listening on the body once again, we would expect to hear a smooth and uniform sound. But this is what we heard this time. Clear, repetitive, impacting sounds. This means that something inside that gearbox is not working as it should be. It could be damaged to one of the mesh inside, could be damaged to a tooth, as we can hear it being highly repetitive. So this indicates to us that this gearbox could be in an early stages of showing a potential problem. So we can highlight that, report it, we can either trend it to see for an increase, or we can then already schedule the, to go ahead and look at maybe the next shutdown or when to actually replace it. So an area that ultrasound does work very well in is looking at slow speed applications because we still have rotating assets that are generating friction. And that friction in turn will generate ultrasound. Now, because of the slower speeds, the level of friction produced is relatively low. So the ultrasonic emission might be, at, might be a bit lower. But, to get, but with this, we're hoping to listen for a smooth, uniform sound. We may not trend the decibel value as closely with this, but more concentrate on the audible quality of the sound. An extreme slow speed bearing will have comparatively no ultrasound produced or very little ultrasound produced. So I'm going to play this next sound file and you may not even hear it, but there is a very, very low level of white noise. So that, that sound recording is just finished. I did hear it just slightly. That's what we would want to hear on an extreme slow speed bearing. The next one is a good slow speed bearing and you should all hear this very clearly. Now, because of the relatively low levels of ultrasound being produced on a slow speed bearing, as soon as we have a potential problem on that bearing, it becomes very apparent in the audible quality of the sound. So a not so good slow speed bearing would sound something like this. As you can hear now, impacting sounds, very clear impacting sounds. The level of sound being produced is still quite low, but the audible quality is very clearly different. So this is where ultrasound can be a benefit to a vibration program, for example, on site. If you already have a vibration program on site, maybe you're not monitoring the slow speed applications. This is where ultrasound can partner up very nicely. So I just want to share one of my favorite um, case studies that I came across um, a few years ago when doing a demonstration on site. Now, on this site was a large um, super dryer installed and it was in operation now then at the time for about six months. So it was very, very new to the site and should be in good condition. And these bearings were quite large dual rolling element bearings that were rotating between seven and 10 RPM. So with this, 
very low levels of ultrasound and not very easily um, monitored unless you're using ultrasound. So I went to site to take some readings, to take some recordings, just to show the benefits of using ultrasound for slow speed applications. There were eight uh, bearings to check on this. They were all the same type, under the same load and the same speed. So we can compare the quality of the sounds and then make a judgment on the condition of them. Out of the eight bearings, seven of them registered zero decibels on the display of the Pro, but we could still hear the sound, so we could do a sound recording and set our baseline at zero decibels, and then we can compare them. And this is what seven of the eight sounded like. smooth and uniform in nature and as we can see from the time series trace there no impact in sounds nothing that is our perfect case study of a good slow speed bearing you could say now one of the bearings that we came across registered two decibels on the display of the pro and the tonal quality had also changed we could hear uh, no identifications of uh, impacting sounds as well and this is the sound that we picked up with the pro as we can see from the trace and the sound quality we're now hearing regular repetitive impacting sounds Straight away after listening to this, I said to the team there that uh, there was a problem with this bearing. To which one of the uh, colleagues there took out a screwdriver, still couldn't hear anything through his uh, Mark 1 screwdriver, um, and said, well, it's only two decibels. Is that really a problem? But if you compare two decibels to zero decibels across seven, eight bearings, that's a 200% increase. So a grease sample was taken and metal particle was identified within the grease, grease sample itself. So on the evidence of the ultrasound and the grease sample, action was taken. They had to get a large crane in to remove the drum first of all, and it spent some quite a considerable amount of time to make the replacement. But you can imagine if this was to fail during production, it would take a lot more time and a lot more money to replace. When they took the bearing out of um, its position, they sent me some pictures of the damage caused. And as you can see from these images, there was large cracks on the outer race. The cage had actually damaged as well. So you can see one of the rolling elements had moved by 90 degrees. And that was evident on the sound file that when the rolling element that was at 90 degrees slid over the crack, the sound was reduced because it wasn't as big as uh, a rolling element rolling over the crack. So this was a great find and a very fortunate find because this was just part of a demonstration. Looking back at um, the root cause, it was on um, installation when the drum was mounted onto the brackets of these motors. So a lot of our critical assets on sites can be also quite hard to access, which means doing maintenance or inspections on them can also prove problematic. So do we need to really stick online monitoring systems on those or anything like that just because we can't access them? Maybe they're not as critical to require the online systems. Remote sensors could be installed, for example, where you could have permanently mounted sensors run into a distribution box where you can plug into that with a probe in an area where you can access. It can also help with the improving the speed of data collection with this. When it does come to online monitoring, you can also use ultrasound for that application as well, where you may have your critical assets 
installed with remote access sensors into a UE forecast system, where this will then be connected over a network to your servers, where you can use the included software, the data management software, to create your asset loop routes, your baseline levels, your alarm levels, set regular intervals for sound recordings, and it will monitor 24 seven continuously all the time. As soon as it hits an alarm level, it will notify you via email and on the software or in chat groups. And it will also send you sound files and bare decibel levels over a period of time that you want to stipulate just to keep you aware as well at the level it's actually operating it currently to. There's also other ways that you can implement ultrasound for online monitoring, and that's looking at using analog sensors. You can, using four to 28 milliamp sensors connected into your um, HMI systems or into your CMMS for simple, quick indications along with other PDM technology sensors as well. You can get vibration sensors in that area, ultrasound in that area, looking at your slow speed areas. Now, lubrication with ultrasound is also a very beneficial way of using the technology to help you with a proactive approach to what you do with your lubrication. Normally, it's always the saying, a little bit more grease never does any harm to the bearing, but we all know these days that lubrication equates to a large percentage of bearing failures. So with this, we're listening to the friction level. We're listening as we apply the grease, trying to improve that friction level, which will have an effect on the decibel value and the tonal quality. So if we're using ultrasound to trend, historically trend our bearings, we will see a rise in the decibel value as the lubrication level starts to reduce. It will stay uniform and smooth in nature, but the decibel value would have increased, which then can tell us that we need to apply grease to our bearings. So a good bearing, again, will sound like it's smooth and uniform in nature. And then if we're using a grease caddy, for example, to apply grease and listen at the same time, this is what a bearing that requires lubrication will sound like as it is lubricated. From that sound file, we can hear the large level of white noise. As, as the grease gets applied, we hear the friction reducing, so the ultrasound starts to reduce. So we keep slowly applying the grease until the sound does not go any lower. Once it doesn't go any lower, that's the bearing telling us that it has enough grease and we need to stop. So we can help avoid over lubrication with this. And in some lubrication programs, the PM might be saying, that to apply a certain amount of grease, and it might be the case that it's not enough. So this will help us with guiding our way through our lubrication program. So when we're doing this, we need to lubricate slowly, allow for the grease to get to the bearing and penetrate. We need to lubricate until the decibel value either returns back to its baseline or does not go any lower. If we start to apply grease and the sound starts to increase, that's an indication that we are over lubricating. So we should stop immediately. And as you can see from this image here, the sound reduces quite quickly as the grease is applied. And then if we carry on applying the grease, the sound starts to increase again. So an indication as to stop greasing because we have over lubrication occurring. So in conclusion to the bearing inspection, Ultrasound can be used as a first technology, you could say, if you're looking at implementing a PDM program at an early stage before any other technologies. Because of the simplicity behind it, we're operating on decibel levels and sound quality. We have the headphones in, we're listening, we're making a good quick judgment as we go along at an early stage. We 
can also use it in conjunction with other technologies like vibration analysis, oil analysis, to help us improve detection rates of potential failures and also gaining our evidence that we need to justify what we would like to do with our assets. And the key areas for using the ultrasound really, one of the big areas and advantages is using it for lubrication and helping us with our slow speed bearings that we have on site. So again, it can be used quite simply and quite easily. So moving on to electrical inspection, another area for us to use ultrasound in. With ultrasound, we are using ultrasound as an efficient method for detecting electrical faults at the earliest stage. stage. Any sort of electrical discharge will cause turbulence surrounding it. And that turbulence generates ultrasound. And as we talked about, the ultrasound being directional, uh, doesn't um, penetrate solid objects, we can use the airborne ultrasound to listen from a safe distance, and we can use the contact approach to listen to ultras ultrasound emissions inside on closed assets. So certain, failure, certain things that we can detect with ultrasound are things like corona buildup, tracking, arcing, and mechanical looseness. And some people might refer to some of these as partial discharge as well. Each of these have their own sound characteristics. So if we detect something, we can do a sound recording and we can analyze to see what's actually occurring. Some of the advantages of using ultrasound for electrical inspection is the fact that it's non-intrusive. We do not necessarily need to have eyes on the components to actually do an inspection. We can inspect from safe distances. We can inspect on closed systems using a contact approach. And it can be used in combination with thermal imaging. It does not replace thermal imaging at all. It's used in combination. So you could use this as maybe a first fast check on something before you open something that's live, for example. So having the two technology approach, one technology will hear the problem, the other will see the problem. So thermal imaging will see the resistance buildup and ultrasound will listen for the discharge. And we can perform sound recordings. We can look into the FFT. If we see spikes or harmonics at the electrical line frequency, be that 50 hertz or 60 hertz, for example, that indicates a electrical based sound. We can then look at the time series of the sound over a period of time and look at the discharge rate, look at the amplitude, look at the duration to help us guide us as to what's going on. So a couple of case studies here on electrical inspection. So the first one was a 400 volt buzz bar. As you can see from the image, it was closed cabin up. We use the contact approach. There's no moving parts in here. So the sound coming from inside the um, cabinet should be relatively low level and quiet. This is the sound that was picked up from the outside of this cabinet. From this sound recording, we can hear repetitive, very repetitive, very strong discharging sounds that are indicating to us that there is arcing occurring inside this cabinet. Now, if I were to have to open that cabinet for my next stage, would I do that after listening to that sound? Maybe not. Maybe I would want to do um, have this run down and then it opened it up first before I do it go any further. But with this it proves that we can listen at an early stage to pick something up before we've opened it and we've done, we've done this check safely. A, another case study was from a service provider that um, we were provided support to, uh, where they provide thermal imaging and ultrasound inspections on their customer's sites in a high rise building this one was done. And it was in a room where we had some 11 kV transformers and what they do first of all is they go into the room, they scan the environment using ultrasound to listen for anything abnormal. If they don't pick up anything abnormal, they then move on to using thermal imaging to do the rest of their inspection. During this inspection, they picked up some sounds that were abnormal and they sounded something like this.
so we can hear the crackling noise, the varying in amplitude, but because the sound is directional using ultrasound and they were using airborne ultrasound at the time, they could stay at a safe distance and locate the source of that sound. It was coming from some 400 volt cables. So they pinpointed where the emission of the sound was coming from and they pulled the thermal camera out and they could see a heat increase in that same spot to confirm the location. Visually from this image, you can see marks from where there's been some heat buildup. This sound recording was clear evidence of tracking occurring. It was a relatively new install that had happened on site and the customer had reported that they didn't believe that there was a problem. So they needed to have enough data to prove to the customer that there was a problem. You have the thermal trace, you have the ultrasound trace. So they turned the lights out and did a video recording of that same spot. And they sent me this video recording. And what you can see, if you look at the middle of the screen as I play this, you will see evidence of tracking occurring. clear there to see that there's a problem and using that evidence was nice and simple using ultrasound they quickly determined that there was a problem at this location at this point and were they able to use thermal imaging to help them with building their evidence that there was a problem the cables were mounted too close together there was an emf a buildup of heat as well that then caused a breakdown of the insulation that caused tracking to start occurring so a good find using these technologies so some final considerations when it comes to electrical inspection is to, first of all, respect our electrical assets. An inspector needs to have enough knowledge and experience before doing these inspections to make sure that they do it in a safe manner. Ultrasound does not replace thermal imaging, it complements it. Used hand in hand can give you good results. An ultrasound can be seen as an added safety barrier when inspecting prior to opening assets, maybe your first line of technology for doing your initial inspection. So in conclusion to today's webinar, I hope you can see that ultrasound is a very versatile technology. One probe can perform a lot of actions. It's also very simple to implement in the early stages of a PDM program because all ultrasound is doing is heightening your senses. All plants should really be looking at improving the energy savings on site. In this day and age, making savings can help save people's jobs and improve people's processes. Also, fun focus on your functional failures you experience and make sure you deploy the right technology to identify those functional failures. Nearly all PDM technologies will complement each other. They will identify certain failure modes and help you with giving the evidence required for you to get the downtime that you need to do your repairs. Make sure you train and educate your workforce. Supplying a piece of a technology onto a site isn't gonna be the game changer unless you train the personnel to how to get the best from that technology. For PDM uh, programs to be successful on a site, Culture change is also key from all levels, from the top to the bottom, because if we have one chink in that chain, it's never going to last. So making sure we have everybody on board to make sure that this works. I'd like to thank you all this, uh, this, well, this morning, this afternoon and this evening for attending this webinar. Uh, my contact details are on here at, um, right now. Please feel free to ask any questions if you'd like to get in touch to discuss anything we're always open to help on our website we have a learning center that is free to access where you can gain lots of useful for material so if there are any questions please feel free to ask but if not i will leave the chat group open for a few minutes um, i will then make a note of them all the questions and get back to you at uh, my earliest convenience so thank you for your time.
So a question here, um, is ultrasound equally effective for oil lubricated anti-friction bearings? So if we talk about um, ultrasound produced via friction, if we have anti-friction bearings, then the ultrasonic emission is going to be extremely low if non-existent. So in that case, not necessarily as um, effective uh, on anti-friction bearings. The webinar will be available to be viewed. Um, it will be uploaded to YouTube um, after we've completed this and we will send out um, an email after this with a survey and a link to that recording too. So yes, if anybody has colleagues that were unable to attend, once you receive the next email with the link, you can um, send that on to your colleagues. And if people want to discuss this in more depth in the future, we will be doing more webinars on the applications in a bit more detail. You can use ultrasound for high-speed machines because with that, we're using, we're listening for the friction. So it doesn't matter if it's rotating, it's going to produce friction. So we can use it for trending high speed and slow speed applications. So integration of ultrasound and lubricant analysis. So this is where at an early stage, for example, if we have a baseline set, and we're listening for a smooth uniform pattern and we start to hear low levels of uh, crackling noises and things like that that might indicate a very early stage problem we then might refer to some sort of oil analysis or grease sampling to help us then with identifying that problem so they would work hand in hand very well there so asking about atex compliancy so we do have probes that are ATEX rated. The um, remote sensors, the fixed sensors, um, the remote access sensors are kind of like a, a dumb sensor. The, the, all the work is happening at the probe, but our online systems are not ATEX rated. So could we differentiate between Corona and destructive Corona using ultrasound? So Corona itself is, um, not destructive in itself. One of the byproducts of, ultra, of um, Corona is, is, nit is um, nitrous oxide, which is like a white powder. Now that's fine on its own, but if you mix that with water, that becomes nitric acid, which then becomes corrosive. So what you would do, if you're picking up um, Corona at a point on an asset, you would make a note of the atmospheric conditions because the more moisture in the environment, the more likely you are to have Corona. But if you pick it up, I would highly recommend a visual inspection next, maybe using through binoculars if you're at a distance, for example, to check for that. So journal bearings in an area that's a bit more of a trickier subject. It's more of a troubleshooting area for those sort of bearings. Um, what type of training do we provide to the customers? So with regards to the training, we can provide very simple, specific application-based training, um, depending on the customer's needs. Uh, we also provide um, CAT1 and CAT2 ultrasound courses, like you get for vibration, thermal imaging, and everything else. And we can very much tailor it. And we can do on-site trainings. We can do classroom-based trainings as well. Can it be used for steam traps? If yes, how? So, Yes, it can be for steam traps. Uh, maybe you were late coming to the presentation, but we're listening for the turbulence on the outlet of the trap. So we can listen on the outlet of the steam trap and listen it for, for the trap cycling up and down. So we can do that quite easily. So the software with the sound recordings will um, be used to check for the amount of energy produced. So we will see if we see a, an increase in energy produced due to, say, a lack of uh, lubrication, we're going to see a higher increase in energy, which in turn will give us a higher decibel value. So and then if we're seeing regular impacting, we may see on the FFT harmonics that are relative to the um, actual failure mode of that bearing potentially. So as there are no limits for ultrasound levels, how should we start using this technology to boost our reliability program? So what you want to do at the start is 
with the technology, have some training, understand what you're wanting to listen to, to gain uh, your baselines, understand what you're listening for, and then it's trending. You collect your first level, you trend it over time. If you have already a bad bearing, then the next time you take the reading, the sound's going to have increased. And it's going to keep increasing over time. If it's a good bearing, it's going to stay at that level uh, for a prolonged period. Um, is there any ex is there um, any expertise required for ultrasound analysis? So I've been to many sites where I've put the probe in the hands of somebody where they're not trained. They've listened to a bearing and said to me, "That doesn't sound good." I ask them why, and they say, "Well, it sounds crackly. It doesn't sound very smooth. It sounds very coarse." And they've identified quickly there that there's a bearing that's got a problem. So it doesn't take a hard, a lot of skills to understand what you're listening for. Ultrasound is heightening your senses, so it's improving what you can hear. So I think uh, I've got so many questions coming in, guys. I'm afraid I can't really answer them all right now. Um, I'm gonna. Answer, I'm sorry if I haven't answered your question yet. I'm gonna take a copy of this chat group. I'm going to. Put all these questions down and I will get back to you, I promise, over the next coming days. So please feel free to get in touch with, my, with me on email. Um, give me a call if you want. We're always happy to help share that. And also look out for any future webinars that we will be doing over the next coming weeks as well. So thank you for your time, everybody.